Thanks for joining us. I'm in conversation with Governor Reserve Bank of India, Dr. Agram Rajan. Governor, many thanks for joining us on Bloomberg and appreciate your time for us. Uh, let me begin by asking you about the global growth environment. 13 central banks in the first few weeks of this year have eased monetary policy. Uh, what does this say? Is, this, is the outlook so dire? Well, um, better than last year. Uh, probably not as good as we thought. I mean, that's what the IMF is telling us. Mm -hmm. It's revised down its forecasts for 2015 as well as 2016. But still, it looks a little better than last year. Now, of course, the big change since last year has been the fall in oil prices. On net, that has to be seen as growth positive. But because there are a number of economies that are stressed as a result, oil producers who are stressed, there could be effects from them. I mean, Russia is a case in point. Nigeria is another one. So um, mixed bag. Um, Europe uh, is still trying to figure out the consequences of the Greek elections. Uh, if that snowballs into something bigger, of course, there's been some uh, uh, evidence in recent days that all parties are reconsidering their statements. Um, these are still tension points and uh, of course one of the worries that I have is oil having, coming down, having come down so much, uh, a lot of um, asset prices reflect the new uh, normal for oil prices but it may not stay that way. And if oil prices start going back up, uh, then we have a whole uh, additional amount of volatility in the system. So, you know, we live in an interesting world. How big a concern is it, Governor, that so many economies are seeking to lower their exchange rate, uh, either directly or indirectly through monetary policy? See, my uh, concern for the last uh, three or four years has been that monetary policy has been relatively ineffective in increasing activity directly through the standard transmission channels and has been trying to do it through two channels which are very related. One is enhancing domestic asset prices and the other is by depreciating the exchange rate. Now, to my mind, both have, have dangers. Increasing domestic asset prices has a danger that if those asset prices are inflated beyond what is reasonable, at some point they have to come back to reality. Uh, that's going to put pressure on the central bank to avoid getting back to reality because of the fear that it will, of the effects it will have on asset prices, the so-called central bank put. The second is that if you're not increasing domestic activity but depreciating your exchange rate, you're essentially drawing demand from the rest of the world. It's a beggar than neighbor strategy. Now we've concealed this by saying monetary policy is going to enhance activity, but if activity is not picking up because of debt overhang, because of other policies not cooperating, then it's essentially is beggar than neighbor, a beggar than neighbor strategy. And this is something that I worry that international organizations haven't paid any attention to. They keep clapping when uh, central banks follow these extreme monetary policies. And we've seen the consequences in a fair amount of exchange adjustment over the last few months. Sure. But uh, are these compensated by greater domestic activity? I've yet to see evidence of that. Sure. So what is your big risk in 2015? Would this be managing risks uh, because of a potential uh, rate hike by the US Fed or greater QE by the ECB or the Bank of Japan? Well, uh, all these, uh, I would say, are things to be um, sort of looking to. I do think the Fed will have to start uh, at some point normalizing interest rates because we live in an extremely uh, accommodative en envi environment the world over. And unless the Fed starts doing it, others aren't going to follow suit. And the Fed, when it does that, will have to accept some appreciation of the dollar uh, simply because it's the first one out of the box. And uh, there's been some noise in the l most recent statement about uh, exports uh, not uh, not being as strong because sure. of the stronger dollar. So these are, I mean, I think we need to normalize. Mm. Uh, but I also think there are geopolitical risks around. Uh, you know, oil producers, as I said, are some of them are fragile, mm. and uh, you know, things could happen that are totally unanticipated. Uh, we didn't anticipate the rise of uh, ISIS. Mm. Um, we didn't anticipate the um, turmoil in, uh, in Ukraine. Sure. 
uh, we have to keep our eyes open for. I, I'll just push this point a little further. With ECB, you know, pushing its quantitative easing, uh, do you think central banks are trying too much? Are they trying too hard? Um, and you're not a big fan of QE, are you? No. Uh, you see, to the extent it operates primarily, it's primarily through the exchange rate. Mm. We have to be concerned about the spillover effects. Uh, and the spillover effects come first from the trade effects of the exchange rate, but also what's causing the exchange rate to depreciate is capital fleeing those countries and going into other countries and, and doing the relative appreciation. So we see a lot of inflows into India, which is why in an attempt to reduce the amount of short-term money we're getting, uh, we ask that reinvestment in corporate securities be at the longer end, sure. above three years, because we had a lot of money sitting at the very short end. This worries us, because what we saw in the turmoil in July 2013 was the short-term money left very quickly. Sure. I want to talk now about uh, growth back home. Uh, we've seen the rise GDP. From monetary policy perspective, uh, you know, does it, in a sense, validate the policy actions taken in 2013? Uh, and does it change your assumptions for the inflation growth trade-offs? See, the revised GDP numbers, uh, if you take them at face value, 6.9% growth for 19 for 2013-14. Uh, to my mind, I need to understand them better be before I, uh, I I comment. If I take them at face value, it looks like we're out of the woods. Right. I would say we're still sort of uh, reaching the outskirts of the woods <laughs> rather than out of them. And so I would like to see stronger growth. Um, and, uh, and, and my sense is the policy actions we have been taking for the last uh, you know, couple of years or more have been in a particular direction. Uh, of course, if these numbers are for real, they validate those policy actions. Sure. But I don't think we can rest right now. We still keep uh, need to keep doing what we're doing. So if this is clouding the outlook, uh, what clarity are you seeking specifically on these numbers? No, I, I'd like to know, uh, you know, uh, where the, the additional growth has come from. Remember, it's come from pushing down uh, levels in one year, uh, and therefore you get a higher growth path. There's a lot which is embedded in the deflator, the GDP deflator. I, I need to understand this better uh, before I can t take uh, uh, strong, make strong conclusions from it. But uh, what I see in the Indian economy is a, a recovery. Uh, we see auto sales numbers, for example, which have stood up despite a withdrawal in excise tax benefits. Uh, we see the number of stall projects coming down. We see a greater intent to make new investments. Uh, so these are all good things. Um, I would like to see these things built upon each other. Uh, but I would say we're still uh, repairing the economy is work in progress. I want to talk about food price inflation, uh, Governor. And about a year ago, you made a fairly significant pr presentation on, on food price inflation and what the RBI is trying to do. Uh, do you think you've done enough? Do you think the government has done enough? Uh, to bring food price, food price inflation down, uh, at least to bring the CPI down to the four to six percent levels in the next in the, in, the, in, the, in the next few years. Well, first, the government has done a considerable amount, including by selling food food grains. Uh, one of the successes has been the limited uh, rise in food grain prices in the market so far. Uh, however, I think we this is again work in progress. Uh, uh, the spring time is when vegetable prices start rising. So have we created enough private warehouse space? Do we have enough capacity to accelerate imports if, uh, if vegetable prices start shooting through the roof? That is still to be seen. There was uh, good food management uh, over the course of the year, which has helped bring down food prices. Has to be tested uh, a few more times before we're confident that it's, it's, it's completely a thing of the past. But my hope is also with the limited increase in support prices for cereals, that more farmers will start thinking of alternative crops where uh, prices have been stronger and firmer. Sure. And we'll get more production in some of those areas where demand has been uh, firmer, but where because cereal prices have been supported, people haven't gone and produced those things. Sure. So between uh, right now our inflation uh, and growth, 
the growth numbers, we still don't know if they're accurate. Uh, I, I understand the CPI is going to be revised very shortly. So between inflation and growth, what are you concerned the most at present? No, I, I'm uh, hopeful that uh, the disinflationary pressures in the system will help us continue towards our target. Um, I do think that growth is weak, uh, despite those, those numbers suggesting they have been stronger. But I also think it's recovering. Uh, my sense is that even though interest rates help in sentiment uh, and that they will help some in consumer demand, uh, there are uh, issues like uh, moderate capacity utilization, uh, impediments in large project uh, setup, which are being tackled, but which are the greater constraints sure. to stronger growth right now. Sure. So um, the interest rate wand is not going to uh, produce all the magic that people expect from it, sure. but it is going to be part of the answer rather than the whole answer. But some say, Governor, that uh, investments have not picked off. Uh, because of the high RB, RBI rates. Uh, what would you have to say to that? You know, ask somebody who's making the statement whether 25 or 50 basis points more lower interest rates will get them to put their assets in the ground. Um, I, I, I'm almost positive, uh, almost certain that the answer would be no. So uh, it's, not, it's not our interest rates. You, know, uh, you have people calling for 200 basis points interest rate cuts before they decide to put more that seems into to be the unanimous ground. call on the street what's that that seems to be the unanimous call on the street not on the street uh, in industry sure uh, which is different from the street because street also takes into account inflation uh, savings uh, other things the economists on the street sure so uh, you know you have to watch for where the message is where the uh, where is it coming from? where is it coming from uh, let me shift the conversation to uh, fiscal consolidation. You know, and uh, for the benefit of our audience, I'm going to read. Uh, well, well, before sure. you go there, let me just emphasize one thing. In this entire debate, we should not forget the fact that our savings rate has come down substantially. Mm -hmm. So we need to keep an eye out for our saver, for our pensioner, because that's what prevents us from becoming a huge current account deficit country. That saving is needed for whatever investment comes in. So even though interest rates have to be lower for more uh, incentives for investment, uh, we have to keep in mind that the saver should not be forgotten. That's why we need to keep interest rates commensurate with the fall in inflation sure. rather than suddenly, you know, uh, cut in such a way that you in enhance investment but then find savings falling off and people buying gold. During the Jan 15th statement, you said that the key to further easing are data that confirm continuing disinflationary pressures also critical would be sustained high quality fiscal consolidation. My question, Governor, is what does high quality fiscal consolidation mean? Are you indicating actual cuts in actual spending of the government? Uh, what is specifically in the budget? What numbers are you looking for? So uh, I don't think it's a specific number or a specific uh, path that we are we're looking at. Uh, what uh, I think, see, I'm not a um, sitting in judgment over the government. Sure. My uh, role is to keep inflation under control. And historically, the uh, problem has been that fiscal, expansionary fiscal policies have an effect of inflation in India. Yeah. Uh, and so I have to worry about that. So it has to be that the package that is put together, and let me emphasize the package, uh, has to be such that it gives us comfort that inflation will not be enhanced uh, by, the, uh, by, the, by the fisc. Uh, and that means a fiscal consolidation path. Now, if the fiscal consolidation path cuts back on revenue spending that is mistargeted mm -hmm. and reallocates that to uh, capital expenditure which is needed, mm -hmm. uh, that will create the possibility of supply down the line, mm -hmm. uh, which will help contain inflation that would be a positive. Uh, so, you know, things like that would be things that we would look for that would give us a sense that the whole package together is moving us in the, in, in the direction that the finance ministry and the finance minister have emphasized they fully embarked on. If you deem that the fiscal consolidation is not of sufficient quality, how does that influence the direction or the magnitude of the monetary policy? So, as I said, it's an input 
into the monetary policy decision because it affects inflation. Sure. That's all. Again, we're not sitting in judgment over the FISC, which the government determines based on its priorities. Okay. So uh, that it will be an input. Uh, you also talked uh, recently about the you know institutions that can look at the budgets. Uh, uh, what did you mean by that? What's the context well, in which? One of the um, um, institutions that give credibility uh, to budgets is uh, something like a fiscal council, mm -hmm. which basically is an independent body which opines on the budget math. Uh, are your projections, I can always create a budget uh, that I you know, look sensible by uh, estimating revenues to be sky high and expenditures to be low, right? So uh, an institution that looks at the budget map, looks at the areas of spending, the areas of revenue, and opines on the overall uh, uh, system for the, benefits of par for the benefit of parliamentarians. Uh, here is what we think about the budget. A uh, number of countries have that kind of institution, but also would look at, for example, long-term entitlements that you put in place. If you put in place an insurance scheme, knowing how population is going to grow. We often put down, here's what it's going to cost for the first year. But what about the second, third, fourth, fifth year as population grows, ages? Do we have in place a full reckoning of what this is going to cost us? Sure. So those kinds of things a fiscal council can opine on. This is something like the Congressional Budget Office that the US has, which essentially costs every scheme in an independent way and gives you the numbers. Uh, that would be a good institution to go to, which would add credibility to the budgets that we are in this government. Uh, I think both the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister have repeatedly said that they are interested in, uh, you know, no slate of hand, but clean uh, performance. I want to talk about uh, bad loans in the banking sector. They are on the rise. Do you see this uh, as a threat to the banking system? Uh, what is the thinking within the RBI to cushion the banking system? A number of steps have already been taken, but what's the thinking right now? See, um, uh, there, there, there are uh, one thing. Let me make very clear. I don't think there's any risk of a crisis from the bad loans in the system, and and uh, there's a there's a reason for it, which is uh, the bad loans are primarily in the public sector system, mm -hmm. which means that the full faith and, and credit of the government is behind that. So it is not going to take down the banks. Uh, so that nobody should be worried about. The banks are safe. But of course, from a taxpayer perspective, we want to limit the losses that the uh, system will incur. That's one aspect of it. But equally, if not more important, we want to put the real assets back on track so they produce value for the economy. Sure. A power plant which is stuck should be put back on track so it produces power, uh, which both benefits the bank, but also benefits the economy. Mm -hmm. Our primary focus has been on that, you know, and that implies recognition of the problem. Mm -hmm. If you keep pretending it's not a problem and pretend that the, it's paying off, etc., mm -hmm. then nobody actually takes action. Recognize it's a problem, get all the players to the table, uh, you're going to pay more, you're going to take a loss here, you're going to take a hit there, share the, share the consequences, and then move forward. We've been trying to make it easier to do that, to restructure the project, put it back on track, make it more effective. Sure. What we have been resisting and uh, what will come to an end is ignoring the problem, pretending that it doesn't exist. So this notion of forbearance, you know, uh, um, yep. treat it as, uh, as performing when it's not performing, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, analysts say, sir, that, you know, uh, some of this has been, the quantum of that bad loans is in fact far greater than what's being reported because of this continuous restructuring of assets that we are seeing. Um, do you think the situation is going to get worse before it gets better? Um, the truth is that uh, in general, um, growth is very, very beneficial mm -hmm. to these kinds of problems. Because it's not that these are houses built in the middle of the desert with no potential occupants. These are uh, power plants, these are uh, roadways which have too little demand. So growth will help. Now, when that growth comes back, uh, that's something we're all waiting for. Uh, for the projects that are stalled, the actions the government is taking will also help put them back on track. My hope is that when you put all these things together, 
that we are closer to the end of the expansion in bad loans uh, rather than the beginning. But are we at the peak? Uh, I can't tell you. You also quite recently spoke about you know, the perceived risks of unburdened foreign investment. Uh, could you elaborate on, on what you meant by that in the context of, of the risks involved? So we are very welcoming to foreign investment. We, uh, we like and we want to treat our foreign investors well and we want to give them a predictable system. Uh, my worry more is in this environment of search for yield as everybody is trying to go to extremely accommodative monetary policies, uh, we get investors who haven't thought enough about the kinds of investments they're making because they know they have very easy exit. And of course, if we treat these investors as, as long-term investors and take their money and invest it in, 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 in big projects and so on, uh, when they want to leave, which they may well as the interest rate environment turns, uh, we should make sure that we have the money to pay them. So I would like to see investors who you know, move into the longer end, not because they can't leave, uh, absolutely protect their right to leave anytime they want, but at least they think a little more about what they're getting into when they invest in longer term assets. So equity, we've never except for one year, had a period when equity investors on net have moved out of the economy. Mm. There's movement in and out, but they've stayed in. Longer term debt is also uh, a place where investors think before they invest, and uh, we've had some stability. Short term debt, we haven't had as much success, which is why we, we've pushed investors into the longer end of mm. debt. Uh, and I think that's been a welcome, it's actually been welcomed by investors because they know that they themselves won't be subject to the risk that some um, you know, players who are very, very short term in nature mm -hmm. will impose costs on them. FIs have been interested in, of course, increasing their exposure on, on the debt side. Uh, government has been wary because of volatility. Uh, but do you think the benefits of capital outflows out, I mean, outweigh uh, ownership, foreign ownership in, in bonds or in debt? And is there a case for the cap to go up? Uh, well, uh, I think over time, uh, we benefit from the liquidity that foreign investors bring. Mm. Um, some of the assessments also as rating agencies and others set up to, to uh, sort of cater to these investors. Mm. We'll get more financial infrastructure. All these are good things. Mm. Um, but we also have to be aware that we are in a world which is uh, extremely uncertain at this point. So I take this one step at a time. Uh, yesterday, we increased the ability of our investors in government securities, where there is a limit now which is binding, to reinvest their interest. Uh, I think this will reward investors who've decided to come into India and stay for the long run, at least uh, the run of one more coupon. Uh, but it'll also reduce the transaction costs that they face. Uh, my intent is to reduce the transaction costs, the hurdles. Uh, for example, we move from T plus one settlement to T plus two settlement, precisely because some of our foreign investors said T plus one was too quick for them. Give us some more time to settle. So we hear them, we want to treat them well, but we also want to be aware of the risks that are building up in the global economy, sure. which I think is important for them also that so long as we protect ourselves, we are protecting them also from rapid and volatile movements in Indian asset prices, which they should be concerned about. The Reserve Bank of India has been nudging corporates to hedge their forex exposure, sir. Do you, do you see corporates sort of adopting this? Are they towing the line? Uh, less than we would wish. Uh, and I think that um, uh, I would emphasize again that um, there's a lot of risk out there in the world. Uh, we are not going to protect corporations against, um, you know, exchange rate instability. Uh, we are focused on reducing volatility when it's excessive, but we're not trying to protect a level, and they may find they're at the wrong end of the level, uh, given the global risks around. So they should hedge, uh, borrowing um, in dollars uh, is like playing Russian roulette, uh, if you're, especially if you're borrowing relatively short term. Could you give us an update on the new monetary policy frameworks? What stage are the discussions on right now? 
Uh, are there any agreements, disagreements? No, I, I think there's, uh, it's ongoing. Uh, it would be unfair for me to comment on it uh, till it's every uh, I is dotted and every T is crossed. But we have exchanged uh, views. There are meetings. Uh, so it's, it's ongoing. And, and uh, I'm hopeful we would come up with something. We haven't heard about the, the COO. The COO, ah, that's an interesting issue. Uh, uh, what we've done is we've uh, completed the rest internal restructuring of the bank. Uh, ideally, a fifth DG would be useful uh, to take care of one set of, uh, of departments. Those departments have been spread amongst the four other DGs that are you know, ha holding additional charge of those departments. Uh, in order to get additional positions, we have to change the act. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have, uh, in a sense, uh, put forward a bunch of proposals. We want to club all the things that need to be changed in the act, not just the four DGs to more. Uh, and when that happens, we'll have room to do the uh, COO. But right now, it's working fine with, with even four. So uh, we may not need to do it, but we'll see. Uh, Governor, you've, be, you've been a very vocal central banker where you've shared ideas beyond banking on a variety of, of areas with the government. Uh, is the government listening to you? I, I th I, well, I hope. <laughs> I hope uh, they are. No, but, uh, you know, uh, th as a, uh, there is a dialogue that is constant, that is on a variety of issues, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that there is a very cordial relationship. Um, Unfortunately, uh, sometimes we sit together and say, why is this happening? Uh, there is uh, you know, uh, a desire to find some daylight between the two positions. And I'm sure you know, uh, we have different views on certain issues. You can always expand that daylight into a, into a uh, fratricidal war, uh, but that doesn't exist. I think there is a, a cordial relationship. And uh, you know, some of my best friends are in government, so uh, uh, it's not a, it's not a, it's not an issue. Governor, many thanks indeed for your time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.